Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Wow. Would it help if I said it in an American accent? Hey, good evening, everybody. Good evening. No, it didn't work. All right, that's cool. So, um, <clears throat> Jesus, you heard of Jesus? Okay, I'm in the right place. Jesus once famously said, a prophet is not welcome anywhere except in his hometown. Um, it's the other way around. A prophet is welcome everywhere except in his hometown. Right, right. That's awkward for me then. So I've had the privilege of being able to go and speak at meetings like this, camp meetings in different places. This is my first time speaking on, in the evening at camp meeting here in the UK. I'm going to say amen for myself. Amen. And, um, you know, let's be honest. We don't come to camp meeting for the chalets. How many of you have seen your chalet? How many of you have claimed the blood of Jesus and bleach over your chalet already? You've, I know the blood washes every stain, but bleach also helps. Yeah, yeah. We don't come for the chalets. Um, we don't usually come for the weather, although so far so good, right? Let's not jinx it. Um, we don't usually come for the food because, you know, they don't sell the right seasonings um, in, the store, in, in, in the shop here, you know, and you have to kind of make do with ingredients. Or if you're like the old school, you just bring your entire kitchen, right? Like you just literally take your entire kitchen from your house and bring it to camp meeting. So we don't come for the food. Um, we come for the fellowship, um, but mostly we come for the spiritual experience. And part of how we usually sell this to ourselves is that we invite someone from far away to come here. And we assume that if they have come all this way, if, if, if they have been, their fare, their airfare has been paid for them to come here, then they must be better than my local pastor. Because like he's been preaching to me along with the elders all year, and, you know, I'm still here in my faith. But maybe if I go to camp meeting and an American or an Australian preaches to me, then maybe I'll really start believing in Jesus. And this year, you know, austerity, budget cuts and all that. <laughs> you know, they got this guy. But you know what the amazing thing is? I'm discovering that God is no respecter of persons and that anyone who is willing and who submits and surrenders themselves to the Holy Spirit can, by, can be used by the Spirit. And so I just want to pray tonight. I want to pray not just for myself, but for all of our homegrown, I'm going to say amen for that, amen, all of our homegrown speakers who are going to be speaking this week, that the Spirit would use us in such a powerful way that we would realize that God is great in England just as he is in Alabama, just as he is in Sydney, just as he is in Denmark, just as he is everywhere. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we need you now. Your word is power. It is fire. We ask that you would send your anointing spirit to open our hearts as we open your word so that an, a, a divine transaction can take place. And what we can experience here is your word made flesh among us, we pray, and that Jesus would be glorified. Oh, Father, that Jesus would be glorified. In his powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen. How many of you voted in the election? Wow. How many of you voted for the right candidate? Let me just keep your hands up. Okay, and who was that? Jeremy, Jeremy, okay. Okay, just to be clear, for those watching online, the Adventist Church does not support any political party. You know, just... But apparently, right, according to all the news, according to the internet, the youth vote students, people like ourselves, well, I'm saying ourselves, I'm kind of old, I've got gray in my beard, but I'm just trying to pretend. People like you guys overwhelmingly voted for Labour, like you got out of bed, you could be bothered, you know, you actually went down, you voted, and it, it changed, it changed everything that everyone was expecting. And what happened was, Theresa May, you remember Theresa May? Remember, she called the election because she figured, man, I am so far ahead in the polls. I am so far ahead. This is going to be like a walk in the park. This is going to be like taking sweets from a baby. This is going to be like taking plantain from a, 
Western Union, well, that's actually quite difficult to take plants in from. But it's, it's going to be an easy thing. And she, she rocked up. She didn't even go to the debates. That's how, that's how, she was like me in my final year of uni. Like, I didn't even go to the lectures. Because I just knew, like, I had that Desmond Tutu, that 2-1. I just knew I had it down, and, and, then I, and, then I, and then it didn't happen. But she didn't even turn up. She didn't even turn up. And then she woke up on the election morning, right? And, and not only did she not get a greater majority, she actually lost what she had. And you know what we call that? She experienced a fall from grace. It was a bit of a disgrace. It was kind of embarrassing. <laughs> fall from grace. We use this term, to fall from grace, to describe when someone goes through an experience where they were up here and then something happens and they end up down there. Like sometimes we use it to describe what happens to an elder at church or a pastor at church who they've been doing well, but then all of a sudden you discover something scandalous about their life, right? And they have to quickly resign and move to another country and start their ministry somewhere else. That, that's not what happened with, all right, anyway, but um, you know, we call that a fall from grace, right? Because you did something bad and you disgraced yourself. Can you, can you turn the slide for me, my? Thank you. Who's this guy? Oh, come on. Well, he said it's too soon. <laughs> he said it's too soon. No, 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 no. Guys, this is, this is the Bill Cosby I'm choosing to remember. This guy, right? Do you remember back in the day? Some of you are not old enough, but do you remember the Cosby show on Sundays? on Channel 4. It was the only program on Channel 4 you could watch with your parents. And I'm old school. I'm before the internet. Channel 4 used to be the thing. Like, anyway, let me not talk about that. So, so, so the Cosby Show, wonderful family, black family. They're doing well. They're doctors and lawyers, and they have all their teeth. And, you know, they, 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 the parents love each other. The parents love each other. Like the mum and dad in the family love each other. Like sometimes it's awkward because there are those scenes at night and he starts doing that whole thing and, and she's doing, whoa, Bill, Cliff, whatever her name is. And it, it makes you awkward, but at the same time you're like, man, I wish I could be in that family, right? And, and there were pictures like this. Next slide. Pictures like this. Do you, do you remember those people? Oh, look at Theo. He looks so young. I remember I wanted to be him. I thought he was a grown man, and now I realize he was just a boy. Look at them. Oh, even with the jewelry, they still look fantastic. Mm. But things changed. Now he's this guy, right? And the thing about it is, yeah, I'm all about second and third chances, right? But 30 women, like 30 women, Bill, like 30. Like if it was two or three, you know, you could say it's Hollywood, it's hating, you know. They're always trying to bring the black man down, right? We could blame it on that. But 30 different people, all with the same story, how they went around for tea and biscuits, and the biscuits weren't really biscuits. Really? And I know right, the, the, the case just happened and it was a mistrial and blah, blah, blah. But, but even if we never know legally what happened, all of us in our heart know that he experienced a what? A fall from, he used to be up here and now he's down here. And so there are some of us who want to do this. Why, Bill, why? Uh, uh, why, Dad, why? Why did you have to do it? Fall from grace. Tonight we're going to be talking about a church that experiences a fall from grace. We are living in really unusual times. Like, how many of you were quote unquote born in the church? Like, you were born in the Seventh day Adventist church, just raising of your hands. It's an awkward expression, isn't it? It kind of means, sounds like your mother was much more interested in prayer meeting than, like, you know, Delivering the baby in the hospital. Like, I was born in the church. Like, none of us were actually physically born in a church, unless some of you were. Any of you that, that was your story? Like, she just took a break between Sabbath school. Boom. I was right back for, like, opening song. No, no, no one's that Adventist, right? 
okay, fine. But all of, many of you were born, quote unquote, born in the church, right? And, and so if you've been born in the church, for, like for all your life, you've been hearing Jesus is coming again. You've been hearing signs of the times. You know, back in the day when they said, oh, the communists, the communism is falling. Jesus is coming. And like, you're like, oh. But like now it's getting like properly scary, right? Like there's a terrorism attack every other week. You're like, come on now. This is, at first it was like, okay, <laughs> that was weird. And then, I don't know about you, like, maybe it's just me, maybe it's because I'm a pastor, but every time I listen to the news now after a terrorist attack, I feel like I'm listening to a prophecy seminar. Because, like, the, the Prime Minister comes out and says, in these times, we need peace, and we must stop all ideologies. And you're like, oh, no, it's going to be us eventually. Oh. Yeah, yeah. It's always, always good when your daughter laughs at your jokes. Right, no, but seriously, like the stuff happening in, in the middle, like, like all these things are happening. And here's the scary part. Oh, help us, Jesus. I used to think that when things really got serious, then I'd get serious too. Right? Like I used to think like, like when it really went down, that's when I'd have the strength to say, TV, no. I'm going to read my Bible. But what I'm discovering is that the scarier it's getting, the scarier I'm getting, but nothing's really changing. And so we were thinking, at a time like this, what other things should we be talking about than about the book of Revelation? And specifically within the book of Revelation, the seven churches of Revelation. Now, if you have your Bible, do you have your Bible? Did you bring your Bible to camp meeting? Awkward. <laughs> Some of you are like, three Sabbath outfits, check. <laughs> Extra shoes, check. Bible, there's no space. It's fine, I'll have 4G. Awkward. That's cool. You can, their Bible is literally in the ABC. Can I just plug the ABC? Like, they still sell physical books. It's amazing. Go look at the museum, and also, if you need one, buy a Bible. Fantastic. <laughs> Anyhow... If you have your Bible, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, here's what the Bible says. It says, the revelation of who? The revelation of who? So the first five words of the book, if you're not very smart like me and you don't understand times and figures and charts, the very first five words tell you what this is about. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not the revelation of Satan. It's not the revelation of the beast. It's not the unveiling of the middle-aged church. It's not the revelation of the Illuminati and Beyonce with her one-eye obsession. It's none of that. It's the revelation of who? And it says that this revelation was given by God. God gave him to show his servants things which must surely take place, shortly take place. That would be me and you. We, we hope to be, by his grace, his servants. We just sang the theme song, Make Me a Servant. So this book is speaking to us. It says, and he sent and signified. What does that word signified mean? What do you think that means? It's, it's not a trick question. There are no wrong answers. There are just some right ones. If, if, you, if something signifies something, okay, let me see how, how old some of you are. How many of you know what this signifies? Okay, what is west side of what? West side of the camp meeting? Like what is? It signifies what? The west side of the US, which was connected with hip hop back in the day. Some of you are too young and you don't understand. And you're also too Adventist, and that's fine. Um, <laughs> Google it, but you know with your parents so that you don't see scary things. But this, this signifies something else. It's a symbol, right? It's, it's something that means something else. So John is saying that this book is signified. What does that mean? That there are symbolic things within this book. The meaning is not just on the surface. You have to dig a little deeper to understand what it means. He sends it and he signifies it by his angel to his servant John. Verse four, it says this. John to who? The seven churches where? Which are in Asia. So, so God gives a revelation to Jesus. Jesus signifies it and gives it to the angel. The angel gives it to John, and then John sends it 
to the Seventh-day Adventists. Is that what the Bible says? Who does he send it to first? The seven churches where? Now, Asia meant something slightly different back in the day than it does today. This is not talking about India or talking about the Far East. This is talking about what we might call today the Middle East. Actually, these seven churches are in modern-day Turkey. These are Middle Eastern churches. And it's interesting to me that at this time of history, when we have no idea what's happening in the Middle East, Jesus has a message for seven churches right in that geographical location. Now, I need you to understand something before we launch into to this. The book of Revelation is primarily first written. Its primary audience is not Seventh-day Adventists with a curiosity of what's happening in the Vatican. That's not why the book was written. It's not primarily written for people in 2017. Its first, its primary audience were seven actual, literal churches that existed at the time when it was written. So if you don't understand that, it's possible that you misunderstand and misinterpret the book because you skip over the first audience and try to figure it out what it means for us, the second audience. Think about the book of Corinthians. It was originally written for which church? Corinth. What about the book of the Philippians? Who was it written for? The same is true about Revelation. It was written for these seven churches. Now, just so that you are clear, it goes on in verse 10. It says this. John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in a book and send it to who? The seven churches which are in Asia, and then it names them. What are the names? To Ephesus, to what? Smyrna, to what? Pergamos to Tyatira to Sardis to Philadelphia, and finally to who? These seven churches, next slide. These seven churches, like I said, were literal churches in what we would call modern day Turkey back in the day that was called. Asia Minor. And as you can see, they followed each other geographically in a line. In fact, many scholars believe that this was an ancient route, an ancient postal route, so that the post would first come to Ephesus and then Smyrna, blah, 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 and then finally to Laodicea. So here is the question I have. Why would Jesus, of all the churches in all the world, of all of time, why would he send the book of Revelation to these specific seven churches first? You know what I think? I think it's because these seven churches had real issues. See, sometimes we think of the Bible as like a fable time where people are perfect, where everyone's just doing the right thing, where, you know, everyone prays and fire comes from heaven and they get manna and all this stuff. But when you read the book of Revelation, especially the messages to the seven churches, you realize the issues they're wrestling with, sexual immorality and believing the wrong things and, and being taught by the wrong people and not having enough love. You realize that these are things that affect us today as people. And what does this tell me? It tells me that the people back then are not really much different to the people back, the people right now. And the amazing thing is that God chose to send messages to imperfect churches with imperfect leaders because though they were not perfect, he is perfect. Though they are not loving, he is loving. Though they are often faithless, he remains faithful. And so he says, I'm going to pick these seven churches, not because of how great they are, but because of the issues they have. And so there is a primary audience. There's a what? And the primary audience are these seven literal churches. But there's a second. There's a second application. There's what we might call the prophetic application, or there is a prophetic interpretation. In other words, while these are seven actual churches, amazingly, in a way that only the Holy Spirit could do, they also mirror seven ages or seven stages of the Christian church right from the time of Jesus all the way down to the end of time. Right from when? The time of when? All the way down to when? And so these seven literal churches mirror prophetically seven ages of the church. 
And night after night, the different speakers will unpack these seven ages. But there is a third way of reading these seven churches. And this is perhaps where we will spend the most time this week. And this is on the personal application. The what application? So there's the primary, there is the prophetic, and there is also the what? In every individual Christian journey, I may find myself from time to time having an experience which mirrors Ephesus or which mirrors Sardis or which seems to be like Laodicea or maybe a combination of two. The Christian journey is not static. That's one of the things that we have to realize. Many of us get confused because we join the church, we get baptized, and then things aren't the way that they used to be, and we think, oh, what's going on? That's normal. We go through phases. We go through ups. We go through downs. But the messages to the seven churches in the book of Revelation speaks a word of encouragement, speaks a word of rebuke, but ultimately speaks a word of hope to every stage that you may find yourself in in your Christian journey. God never wanted you to be without hope and without guidance, no matter what phase of life or Christianity you may be in. And so tonight, we're going to start, next slide, looking at Ephesus. John has this vision, and in this vision, he sees Jesus, and sorry, this is the best picture I could find. He sees Jesus standing among these seven lampstands, and he's holding seven stars in his hand. And right before we launch into the message to Ephesus, at the end of chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, Jesus explains what the symbol of the lampstands and the stars mean, what they signify. Verse 19 of chapter 1 says this, Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. Verse 20, The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are what? The angels of what? See, this is the amazing thing that I love about the Bible and specifically about the book of Revelation. It explains itself. Like, okay, there's a 5 or 10% that's tricky, but most of it, if you keep reading, it will tell you what the symbol means. The seven stars aren't the seven points on the BMW rim, right? The seven candlesticks don't represent the seven leaders of the G7. Like, you don't have to guess. It blatantly tells you the seven stars are who? The seven what? Angels and the seven lampstands are the seven what? And which are the seven churches? We just read them, right? Who, who might the angels of these churches be? Is God speaking to seven special angelic beings in heaven that have some special oversight over these seven churches? Could be. But if that's the case, that would be awfully strange. Because we just read that God takes the revelation. He gives it to Jesus. Jesus gives it to a special angel. The angel gives it to John. John gives it to the churches who then give it back to angels in heaven. Like, why go through the, all of that? Why not just pass it sideways, right? So for me, and there are many other reasons, but we won't take time tonight. For me, it doesn't make sense to see these seven angels as seven literal beings in heaven with wings. But rather, they are angels in the Greek sense of the word. The Greek word there is the word angelos. Can you say angelos? Angelos. It's the same word that is the name of the uh, Chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, right? She's... Uh, Angela, Angela. It means messenger. It means messenger. So these are seven special messengers to these churches. Question, does your church have a special messenger who comes around every week or two weeks and gives messages to the church that they claim are from God? Do you, do you have someone like that in your church? What, what's another name that you call them? Pastor, right? Or maybe an elder, right? You, you, have, you have spiritual leaders in your church. They aren't perfect, right? But, but, but they pray, they study the Bible, and they come, and they bring a message from God. In this sense, they are angels, which means that you shouldn't treat them like the devil, right? Yeah. 
you shouldn't mess with God's angels. Not all angels have wings. Not all angels can fly. But if God gives someone a message, that makes them an angel. He has heavenly angels. He has earthly angels. He has heavenly messengers and earthly messengers. And by the way, if you have accepted Jesus, you become a messenger. So in a sense, you are angels too. And the Bible says that Jesus is holding these messengers, these leaders in his hand. Now, forgive me, I have to preach this to myself for a moment. Because sometimes as a leader in the church, it feels like people try to hold us with everything but their hand. They put their mouth on us. They put their foot on us. They elbow us. They distrust us. But where it matters most, my pastor friends, Jesus is holding us in his hand. And he will not let us go. We might sometimes feel like letting go of the responsibility, but Jesus will not let his leaders go. If your pastor is struggling, pray for him or her. Not pray on them. Jesus is found in the midst of the candlesticks. He's walking around his churches and he's holding their leaders in his hand. And now we come to where we've been trying to get. Chapter two, verse one, it says this. To the angel, to the, to the leader, to the messenger of the church of Ephesus, write. Next slide. Ephesus was the gateway city to Asia. The word Ephesus, the name Ephesus literally means desirable. It was a place where people wanted to be. It was a rich town. And it was a town where they had one of the great wonders of the world, the Temple of Diana or the Temple of Artemis. Next slide. This is a a depiction, uh, this is a, 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 how can I say, a recreation of what they believe the massive statue in the center of the Temple of Diana in Ephesus looked like. Some of you may remember in the book of Acts, there was a story where Paul uh, got into some trouble because of this Diana, and they were in Ephesus, and people were shouting all day, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Maybe you remember this story. This is Diana of the Ephesians. Now, you'll notice it looks like maybe she has come from the market with quite a few papayas or some other fruit. Uh, of description. Those aren't fruit, sort of. Uh, How can I say this and keep this stream friendly? Um, The Ephesians believed that Diana was a hunter and that she was the goddess of fertility, right? And so in their mind, it made sense to represent her as having uh, not just two mammary glands. Can I say that? Can we say that? Is that... Is that... (laughs) That's science enough, but several, okay? So sister has had all kinds of cosmetic surgery, and, you know, and what's, what's really messed up is that this is just like, you know, if you look at the whole statue, it just goes all the way down. Like, she's got breasts on her feet. Like, I, I just thought, like, how is that even practical? Do you know what I mean? Like, you just step, it's just, it's messed up. But this, but this was Ephesus. It was a city of love. It was a city of sex. It was a city of power. And in this city, Paul had planted a church. Don't miss this, I'm going somewhere. In the city of love, in the city that is desirable, he had planted a Christian church. And they had started to grow. And things were going well. And hear how the Spirit describes what an Ephesian Christian was like. What a what? Ephesian Christian. I want you, as we're reading this, I want you to think to yourself, am I an Ephesian? Do I know an Ephesian? Here's what they were like. These things, says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Verse two, I know your work, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. Do you know anyone in your church who works hard for God, who labors, who is patient, and who just can't stand those who do evil. Have you met any people like that before? Maybe you're someone like that. If you are, you might be an Ephesian Christian. They just, they just, they just are committed. You know, there are some people at church where if you say prayer meeting starts at 7, they get there at 6.45, and then there are the rest of us who just don't come? Is it just my church or is prayer meeting dead? Is it dead in your church too? It's just like, 
Like, I have to go because I'm a pastor, right? But, like, I get there, and it's, like, me and three other people. And they all look at me because I'm a pastor, you know, like, okay, let's see how you can keep us entertained for an hour, you know? And I'm, like, oh, trying, and I'm singing, I'm doing what, you know, just doing my best, trying to bring the best word, and they're just, like, I'm just, like, oh. Those aren't Ephesians. Ephesians are the committed people. Ephesians are the people who come to the church work day. Do you guys still have church work days? Like usually on the May bank holiday where you clean up the church and do all sorts of things. And they always advertise it as, you know, in the announcements. And next week we'll be having our special church work day. All the men, with all the men, with all the men, please come there. And then you get there, it's like four women. But like these are like the strongest women you've ever seen. They're like cooking roti with one hand while painting the youth hall with the other. It's just like, how are they doing this? No one understands. These might be Ephesian Christians. Do you know any Christians who just can't walk past someone doing the wrong thing without saying something? Right? Like you stopped thinking it was wrong like 10 years ago. But every time they see it, how come they're not married? And you're just like, oh, it doesn't matter anymore. It's 2017, at least there, you know, as long as they're in love. But like, they, like that thing just burns them up. They might be Ephesian Christians. You know what's interesting about Ephesus is that Ephesus, this represents the first generation of Christians. Next slide. This represents the generation of Christians who were nurtured by the apostles. These aren't people, don't miss this. These are not people who grew up in the church. These are people who joined the church. These are people who used to be pagan. They used to worship at Artemis Temple. They used to, used to, used to. And then Paul or Peter or Timothy or, or someone or Junior or, or Mary came and brought the message to them and they became followers of Jesus and they were passionate about that thing because they had to give up family. They gave up respect. They gave up money to follow Jesus and so they took it serious. I don't know about you, but I tend to find, it's, it's a generalization, but I've tended to notice that people who join the Adventist church, who didn't grow up in the Adventist church, tend to be just a little bit more serious about Adventism than some of us who kind of grew up in it. Like for us, Sabbath is like, oh, Sabbath again. Can't watch my cartoons. But for them, it's like, you don't understand. I used to be drunk in a pub, and then Jesus found me. And if I have to turn off the TV, I will turn it off. And you're like, yeah, but what if it's a nature program? Like, is that bad? Like, they're like, no, nature or no nature. I'll cut off the electricity if I have, you know. Like, like they're really serious. Those tend to be Ephesians. Or, or, or maybe you grew up in the church, but you went through a reconversion experience, and now it means something to you. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way. Watch how it continues. And you have tested. They have done what? The Ephesian Christians are Christians who test things. Like they actually study their Bibles. Like they can, they can know that Hezekiah 3.16 is not a book in the Bible. You, you do know Hezekiah is not in the Bible, right? Like it's not a book in the Bible. Some of you are like, are you sure? No, no, <laughs> that's Habakkuk. It's fine. You're probably not Ephesian. Like, like an Ephesian memorized that thing. They know. And they have tested. Watch this. They have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. Oh. You want to get an Ephesian Christian excited? Introduce them to a false prophet. I mean, they will tear them apart. Like they will make a YouTube channel where all they do is point out all the false apostles. And some of us are like, we judge them, but no, understand their passion. They're like, no, no, you can't play with this. You don't understand, I used to be deceived. How can you mess around and be like, oh, does he know, doesn't he know? Let's just love everyone. No, let's not love everyone. Let's know the truth. That's Ephesus. And that's not a bad thing. These are all compliments. It probably says something about us that these sound like negatives. Because these are complex. This is Jesus bigging them up. It probably sounds something about me that I'm like, mm, I really don't want to be like that. Like, oh, that's just way too extreme. That sounds like the kind of people that Theresa May wants to stamp out. Watch what happens though. 
And you, verse three, have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name. Ephesian Christians actually share their faith. Like they witness. They're the four people who turn up to hand out tracts. And all the church was invited. Verse four. Nevertheless, what does that word nevertheless mean? It means like in spite of all this amazing stuff, I just do have one thing, there's one little issue. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your what? You have left your what? Here is the trap that many of us Ephesians or many of us going through a quote-unquote Ephesian stage and certainly the church in the first century, here is a trap that we often fall into that we think that if we just do enough, if we just sacrifice enough, if we just obey enough, if we just get serious enough, then Jesus will accept us. Jesus will, will, will let us into heaven. But, but Jesus is saying, I love all you're doing. It's fantastic. There's only one issue. You see seem to have forgotten your first love. Next slide. Next slide. Keep going. In the original language, the word there to forget is literally to fall. You have fallen from your first love. Galatians chapter 5 verse 4. This, by the way, is the only verse in the Bible that uses the phrase to fall from grace. And I assume that this is probably the place where we got the expression to fall from grace. Watch what Galatians chapter 5, watch how how Galatians chapter 5 verse 4 defines what it means to fall from grace. See, we use the term fall from grace to describe somebody who was doing great things and then they messed up and they did bad things. But watch what the biblical definition of the phrase is. Chapter 5 verse 4. You have become estranged from Christ who do what? Are you with me? Galatians 5 verse 4. I'm going to give you some more time. Galatians before Ephesians chapter 5 verse 4. It says this. You have become estranged from Christ who attempt to be what? Just, what does that word justified mean? In simple language. It means, it means to be right with God, to be in a right relationship with God. You, are be, you have become estranged. Estranged is the word that we use when someone is married to someone, but they're not living together anymore, right? You've heard that term? Like that couple is estranged. That means that they're going through some couple issues. You have become estranged from Christ, Paul is saying, when you attempt to be right with God, How? By doing what? By the law. By all the right stuff I'm doing. When that becomes your methodology of being right with God, you become estranged from Jesus. You have fallen from grace. Did you catch that? Some of you didn't catch that. Let me fly by again. To be fallen from grace is not to mess up and make a bad mistake. That would be to fall into grace. Because the Bible says, where sin abounds, what? Grace much more abounds. So when I mess up and make a mistake, if I come to Jesus, I haven't fallen from grace, I've fallen into grace. To fall from grace is to try to be justified, to try to be right with God by my own efforts. To fall from grace is to think that I can do enough to be okay with God. Ephesians wrestle with this because they look at where they've come from and they are so passionate and praise God for that passion, never to go back there that the temptation can be, let me make sure. Not only will I never again feast on the swine, I will never again feast on the fowl, nor the fish, nor the veggie meat, nor even the tofu, but I will graze on the wheat grass. And by this, I will be so far from being close to the precipice. 
And it makes sense. And the motivation maybe is coming from a good place. But if you start to think, oh, help us, Jesus, that because I don't, and because I don't, and because I don't, that somehow I'm closer to God, you've missed the point. You've lost your first love. When Jesus first came to you, he wasn't offering you a better diet. He was offering you eternity with him, and the diet was a bonus. When Jesus first found you, he wasn't offering you a better day to worship on. He was offering him a relationship, you, a relationship with him, and a day to celebrate. And sometimes we forget that in our attempt to be righteous. Fortunately for us, we're running out of time, but real quick, of all the seven churches, there is actually a book to Ephesus in the Bible. So we can know specifically what the Ephesians were taught about Christianity. We can know specifically what maybe they had fallen from. Ephesians chapter two, verse four says this, but God, Ephesians two, verse four, wait for them, the Spirit says, wait for them. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. Are you there? It says, but God who is what? He is rich in what? See, God is not rich in silver and gold and houses and land. I mean, he has all of that. But what makes God really rich is that he's merciful. What is mercy? See, most of us don't know because we never experienced it. Mercy is the ability to see people doing something wrong and treat them good anyway. That's what mercy is. Mercy makes, let me just be real honest right now. Oh, I'm about to tell you the truth. Help us, Holy Spirit. Do you know one of the reasons I believe why Seventh-day Adventism in the UK tends to attract, how can I say this, people of a certain ethnic persuasion? Are you, are you following me? Like, you with me? Afro-Caribbeans. Okay. All right. You know why? Because the way that we preach the message connects with the way that many of us were raised. We were raised in a culture, there's nothing wrong with culture, but where if you mess up, you get what? Licks. Translation, you get physical discipline. It's... Okay, none of you are social workers? Cool. All right, so... No, but seriously, like, like it, it, it messes with our brain. Like, when, when, okay, when you see a child of, how can I say this? Um, a milder complexion, is that, is that, I don't know, how, um, on, on, you know, in Tesco's, whatever, and like, them, they have asked their mum for a Mars bar, right? And their mum says no, and their response is, oh! Right? In, in, in your Afro-Caribbean mind, what happens? You just go to praying, Jesus, we come to you now. We plead the blood of Jesus as this child dies for their sins. Have mercy in the judgment. Because if you ever even thought that phrase, the justice of God, forget the investigative judgment, straight to the lake of fire, right? And then you see mercy and it messes you up. Billy, don't be rude. (laughs) Billy, don't be rude. I will beat Billy for you. I'll take the hit. I'll go to jail. (laughs) Billy cannot get away with that. That like, that, you're laughing, you're laughing. But this is exactly how we feel on the church board. When the young lady gets pregnant out of wedlock. We have a hard time saying, yes, but she's repentant and there's grace. Because someone has to pay. We can't have that bad example. Now, let's not talk about the fact that me and my wife got married rather quickly back in the day. And that my son is 15 years old, but we just celebrated our 14th marriage anniversary. Let's not talk about that. Let's talk about this girl right here. And culturally, there are other cultures that just, they just can't get with that kind of picture of God. That just doesn't, that just doesn't feel like God to them. And that's a whole other issue. But but here's the point. The Bible says God is rich in what? And that sounds unjust to Ephesians. How can you have mercy when they're messing up? 
time and time again. And secretly, isn't that the question you ask in your own heart? How can I be right with God? How many times have I said I wouldn't do it again? I mean, I'm not doing the big things everyone can see. I eat wheatgrass when they're watching. But every, but, but every now and again, every now and again, when it's just me, how can God keep forgiving me? Because Ephesians, he's rich in mercy. This is the message to the, oh, thank you, Jesus. This is the message to the Ephesian church. Didn't write that to the Corinthians. He wrote it to the people who needed it. Not only is he rich in mercy because of his great what? His great love with which he loved us. Even when we were when? Oh, read your Bible. Even when you were what? Not after you got baptized. See, some of you think, oh, because I got baptized and because I'm living the life, now God loves me. No, no, no. He loved you when you were dead in trespasses. made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That lampstand in heaven that represents Ephesus is not there because they're great, it's there because Christ is great. And even though they're still imperfect, he's put their lamp in heaven because he believes his grace is great enough to get them where his grace has already declared them to be. that in the ages to come, verse seven, he might show, oh, thank you, Lord, the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us. Oh, you missed it. You just missed your shout. See, there are other beings who don't understand what grace is because they've never had need of it. They've always been perfect. And so in the ages to come, in the when? In the ages to come, that, would that be heaven? Could we say that's heaven? It's like when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be, all that good stuff. At that time, God wants to say, hmm, how can I help the people who have never known grace to understand the exceeding riches of my, oh, I know how, I'll use the Ephesians. They're so messed up. They're so broken. Their life is such a mess. They are such disgraces that if they can make it here, the only explanation that the universe will give is like, wow, isn't the grace of Jesus wonderful? You do realize that's why you're going to heaven. Not so people can say, oh, well done. You've made it. You stayed away from all the bad stuff. Aren't you great? You're going to heaven so people can say, oh, my goodness. Jesus, you're amazing. I mean, look at that guy. I was just, he got in. Jesus, you must be, you must be the best. Because, I mean, if, if they can get in, I mean, it's, we've seen the records. You do know they get to see the records. Like, they stream this. Like, <laughs> like even when you delete it, like, they, is still, they still save it. Like, they, if they can make it, the only explanation, Jesus, you're amazing. That's why you're going to be there. Not to bring glory to yourself, to bring glory to Jesus. I'm going to wrap up. Quickly, last two slides. There's so much more. Let me read this. Some of you will not believe me because I'm just a pastor. Let me see if a real prophet says it. <clears throat> Selected Messages, page 370. She's commenting on this passage. She says this. Let each member of the church study this important warning and reproof. Let each one see, oh, help us. If in contending with, for the truth, if in debating on the theory, he, she has not lost the tender love of Christ, has not Christ been left out of the sermons and out of the heart? She's talking to her Adventist brothers and sisters. Is there not danger that many are going forward with a profession of the truth, doing missionary work? They're great Ephesians, but what? While the love of Christ has not been woven into the labor. That's why we find it easier to invite you to the meetings than to visit you afterwards. Because <laughs> we don't have the real love of Jesus woven in the work. Jesus says to Ephesus, I, I, I've got to go. The end of, the, end of <clears throat> Revelation chapter 2, verse 5. Remember, 
Therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. Repent, repent. This lack of God's grace and love in our lives is something that we need to repent of. Did you catch that? If it's something we need to repent of, then could we say that it's a sin? Oh, you missed it. Not, not understanding God's grace is a sin, friends. Yeah, it's a sin. It, it, it's a sin that will keep you out of heaven. It says, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Translation, you can't go to heaven. Oh, you're missing it. You could have your life perfect on the outside. All those sins that you're hoping that this week you'll finally overcome, you could overcome them. But if you don't get the love of Jesus in your heart, you're not going anywhere. That's, no, that's serious. Like, like, that, like that's, that's getting me right here. Because all my life I've been trying to perfect myself. But the amazing thing is, when you depend to the grace of Jesus, the grace of Jesus not only forgives you, but it perfects and grows you. Is love enough? But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. I wish we had time to talk about that. Verse 7, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Spirit has a message for his church. I want to make a, a brief appeal tonight. And it's that we would hear the voice of the comforter of the Spirit as he speaks to us. That, he, that we would respond. So I sing this simple, this simple song. If you know that you need to respond to the grace of Jesus, if you know that you have been depending too much on your own efforts to be right with God and not enough on the righteousness of Christ, so if, I, if as I sing this song, the Spirit speaks to you of that. Would you just stand with me? Because I want to pray with you. Comforter, maker of new life. We need your power tonight. Comforter, you make all things new. Our eyes are fixed on you. We hear your voice calling out to us. Breath of God, fall like holy fire. Consume all our desires. <clears throat> we hear your voice calling out to us as seek, find me. And I'll be bomb to make the wounded home. And I'll be water, living water, gushing up within your soul. I seek, find me, and I'll be bomb to make the wounded at home, and I'll be water, living water, gushing up within 
your soul. Don't you hear the Spirit call? Hear the Spirit call. Hear the Spirit call. Hear the Spirit call. Ask, seek, find me. And I'll be a bomb to make the wounded whole. And I'll be water, living water, gushing up within your soul. I seek, find me, and I'll be bomb to make the wounded whole. And I'll be water, living water, gushing up within your soul. Don't you hear the Spirit call? Hear the Spirit call. If you hear God's Spirit tonight, Would you just stand? If you need him to be a a balm to make your wounded wounded heart whole. If you need him to be like water gushing up within your soul. Father God, we, we are Ephesians tonight. We live in the city of love, but we have lost our first love. We work so hard, we persevere, even when it's difficult Even when church is not interesting, even when all our friends quit years ago, we're still here because we believe and because we just want to do the right thing. But so often, Lord, we've lost that sense of love. We don't really talk to you. We do for you. We don't really enjoy your presence. We just just tell people about things that we know about you. Lord, and tonight the Spirit has convicted us You have spoken to us, Jesus. You have said that you are great in mercy. And even though we don't understand always the balance between your your justice and your mercy, tonight we accept the truth that there is nothing that we can do in our own strength to make ourselves right with you. But because of what Jesus has done, because of the sacrifice of the Lamb, we can be washed from sins in his blood. And the beautiful promise of the gospel is your power is greater than our sin. Not just great enough to forgive it, but great enough to erase it. Great enough to transform us, to make us new, to make us shine like the stars of the heaven. And Jesus, that's what we're asking for tonight. We're asking that we would abandon ourselves, abandon our strength, abandon our work, and fall deeper in love with you. That we would be known not just as the church that know the truth, but we would be known as the people who love Jesus and who love his truth. Well, this is my prayer. This is my prayer. In your name, amen. I see-